Hi, my name is Paul Sargent and welcome once again to AP Euro Bit by Bit, the series in which I'm trying to teach you modern European history in small bite-sized pieces so that you can better understand it. Today, we're going to take on an art movement known as Mannerism, which is one that not a lot of people know a lot about and, luckily enough, not one that you need to know that much about. But let's take a look. Start the intro. Okay, so as you may know, if you watch my videos on the Renaissance, you understand that the Renaissance was all about depicting reality. It was about trying to figure out what human bodies were exactly proportioned by, figuring out depth and scope and lighting and all kinds of things and trying to make the perfect depiction of reality. And when you hit the high renaissance with guys like Michelangelo and Raphael, I mean, you've pretty much hit it. This is the pinnacle in all of this. And so these people who come in their shadow, who come behind them, what do they do? Like, how do you do better than Michelangelo? Well, you totally throw out all the rules that they came up with and you try and make something completely different. Now, if we look at Mannerist paintings, what we really see is a few characteristics. Number one, you see huge elongation of figures. In other words, the perfection of the Renaissance is now being portrayed with distortion and elongation. So for an example of what I'm talking about, this is a painting called The Venus with the Long Neck. Like, you seriously cannot miss the fact that this neck is too long. Her fingers are too long. Baby Jesus is just, like, ill-proportioned. This is intentional. This is the artist trying to say that perfection has been reached, and now we're going to go beyond perfection because we can do perfection. We figured it out. And so now we're going to play with it a little bit. And it portrays an emotional state here. Um, and that's sort of the big idea behind Mannerist paintings. You can always notice them because of this elongated figure. Also, the other thing that you'll notice about these paintings is that whereas in the Renaissance, the central figure is right in the middle, that's the focus point, is the center of the painting, in most Mannerist paintings, the focal point is not directly in the center. It's off to the side, it's a little bit high, it's a little bit low. The center is kind of a bit of a void. So, there's one painter that's identified that you should probably know about, and his name's El Greco. Now, El Greco's story is a great one. He's born in Greece, he's influenced by Byzantine painting, he then comes to Italy, he's influenced by the high Renaissance painters, and then he ends up in Spain where he does some of his greatest work. And his work, many art historians will say, reflect the turbulence of the time, being the Protestant Reformation. The solidity of the Catholic Church has been torn apart by Martin Luther, John Calvin, and all those other guys who are fighting against a centralized church with a centralized message that they see is flawed. And so, these works portray that insecurity, that, that unknowingness, that turbulence that's going on. And in Spain, with the Spanish Inquisition, Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! Anyway, in Spain with the Spanish Inquisition, there's a lot of turbulence going on. In El Greco's resurrection, you can see this emotional quality and you can see this religious fervor that was really gripping Spain at the time, which was fighting against the forces of Reformation. This is where the Spanish Inquisition comes from. I think I've said that already. Anyway, you can see those elongated figures, you can see that emotion, you can see that uncertainty, but you can also see that religious fervor, that intense devotion to religion. This painting is called The Burial of Count Orgaz, and you can see here the characteristics that we've talked about with mannerism. Elongated figures, a central theme, but a very empty center of the painting. There's definitely emotion here, there's definitely a real somberness to this, but there's also the picture where they're playing with what the masters had already created in an effort to separate themselves from the masters. This is a great example of El Greco's work. 
El Greco actually offered to repaint Michelangelo's Last Judgment, which is on the back wall of the Sistine Chapel. This majestic vision of heaven and hell with Michelangelo kind of hanging as a skin, that's really what it is, in the middle of the picture. El Greco felt that he could do better than Michelangelo. Not sure about that. Not my thing. So, where does mannerism fall into our study of the art side of European history? Well, it follows on the heels of the High Renaissance, and it reacts against the High Renaissance value of perspective and of proportion and all of that, and it exaggerates everything. It also amplifies the emotion of the Renaissance and sort of turns its back on Renaissance piety, especially in Italy. But it's a very short period, lasting from about 1520 to about 1600, and those are rough dates. It's followed by a much longer artistic movement called the Baroque, where they'll take that emotional quality of art and they'll try and amplify that to an absolute extreme. And we'll take a look at that in a future video. So, in conclusion, that's mannerism as best as I can explain it and as much as you really need to know for the AP exam. If you're looking for a more in-depth discussion of mannerism, look off to the side here on the YouTube page. I'm sure there are links over there which will give you more information. So, until next time, my name is Paul Sargent. This is AP Euro Bit by Bit. If please subscribe to my channel so that you get notified when I post new videos. Till then, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.